thank you for the short intro. Um, so today I'm going to talk about no ops, and um, the subtitle is basically uh, that we basically got so good at doing DevOps that we need a new enemy. Um, it helps when it's switched on. So to get that thing out of the room, as Chris mentioned earlier, everything is a DNS problem. Who of you has a .io domain? Who of you remembers what happened around two months ago when on the Wednesday afternoon everything started to failing suddenly and things w went wonky and your monitoring solution started to flap around? Yes, exactly. Um, the root DNS servers of the IO domain went bang and everything fo started to fall apart. So Chris is really right and every, th every time when I find like a hard problem and I cannot solve it and there's nothing in the logs. I first go to, okay, let's look at DNS and probably the, the solution is there. Um, short introduction about me. I'm a system engineer at the Maisy IO. We're a Swiss company, but our team is completely remote. So I'm the only one in Europe currently. The rest is mostly in the States and traveling around. Um, we open sourced or open source all our tooling, so we believe strongly in having a full, oh, fully open source stack. Um, we are also some people that run um, containers in production. Yes, this is scary, but it's manageable. Um, as said in the Herald, uh, I'm from Zurich, Switzerland, so I didn't have a long commute here, so that's, that was nice. Um, you can find me on Twitter, I'm at Das Recht. And I'm a person that has way too many side projects, so I'm part of the DevOps Day Zurich team. Um, a few years back, we founded an association which owns a full rack with two times 10 gig fiber to basically host or, um, or own servers or side projects somewhere where the companies are, like that we don't impact our own companies. Um, I also run some Tor exit nodes for fun, and it's really fun, and uh, I need, if somebody has some rack space and wants to help me with that, talk to me afterwards. Um, yes, and I also happen to work with real containers, so that's me, and on the back of the car, that's a container. Um, when you deploy it, it looks like this. You have a crane, and you deploy it. That's how you do containers in the real life. Um, that was for a side project where I was asked if I can do the whole event organization for an outdoor cinema. And I say, yes, sure, because you, wherever can you play with 64 amps of power? So I did that. So enough of talking. Um, let's dive into the topic of today. Um, I'll briefly touch on what is no ops. I'll look um, how the feelings are around this. And then we do a small DevOps recap, and I basically tell you where we are currently on, the, um, on our journey into DevOps. Then we have a closer look at NoOps, and in the end, we will conclude that you won't lose your job due to, uh, to, to NoOps. Um, so NoOps is fairly old. It's basically co uh, was coined by Mike Gualtieri in 2011. So that's quite a long time since it's been out there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I want to, to hear you or like give me some hands. Like, how do you feel about no ops? Does it threaten you? Is it something bad? How do you feel about this? Like, if you feel bad about it, hands up. Some hands. So now. Do you feel, well, I fucked that up, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, who feels good about it? Hands up, okay. And who feels bad about it? Just some. Okay, we're in, like, I've done my part, so I can go. Um, so, I'll drive uh, into that topic in a little bit, but first, um, let's a little talk a little bit about DevOps. It's about culture and collaboration. So. As a short reminder, um, DevOps is a cultural paradigm. It's in its core tries to get the most out of your team. It's about 
automation, it's about affecting your culture to the better, it's about measuring all your changes and your team to really make a difference. It's also about sharing and security. And I also sometimes add sanity, because when it comes to containers, you need a lot of it. So who of you is really good at DevOps? OK. And who thinks, if you look around, everybody else is so much better at this? Yes. We're in this two together, because when I read the blog posts or watch all the talks I see from conferences, I feel like, oh my god, we're just at the beginning. We're failing everywhere. So where are we on, on our DevOps journey? So we still have that feeling that if we look around in other companies, talk to other people, that um, the others are just way better. Um, but as we are a remote team, we learned to work better across multiple time zones. This is especially hard if you have somebody um, somewhere in uh, Australia and you have 12 hours time difference or between Australia and uh, the States you have 18 hours and you're like, uh, dude, what's your time? And it's like, yeah, I'm a day ahead of you and then everything gets very confusing. So you start to learn how to collaborate more. Um, we also try to automate as much as possible. Um, that means like all the small tasks, like the whole building stuff, which comes up once every month and is a pain. You just start to automate it away because you can replace it with a small script in the end. Um, we also got really good at um, doing blameless postmortems. So who of you do, do has a blameless culture? That's good. Every hand should be up there. So, small story, like a few months ago, one of my uh, employees pinged me in the afternoon, like, Bastion, we have a problem. Like, yeah, what's it? And I was like, yeah, probably Puppet doesn't run, or a container died, or whatever. And it's like, have you seen the monitoring? And I head over to the monitoring, and open it, and I see all sides of one customer so down. Like, what did you do? Um, I cleaned up. <laughs> I was like, okay, okay. You cleaned up. What did you clean up? Um, yeah, just some files. So you know where that's going. So in the end, I was like, okay, that's not a problem. Shit happens. Let's look at how we can solve this. And I immediately picked up the phone, called the customer, like, hey, there is a problem. We are on it. And uh, if there, if you have, can you prioritize your sites? Probably you have some that need to be online much faster. And we did that. And I was like, all the time, I was like, okay, 10 sites offline is not too much fun, but let's not blame us because it was possible to do it. So let's improve on that. And we always try to improve on, on things and try to make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen. In the end, we were lucky. Uh, we have a good backup system, so we basically restored everything in like half an hour, an hour. Um, the customer was very happy and impressed that we can do it that fast. And he was like, oh, it's so good. I trust you that you have really nailed it down how you do it. Um, another thing is, he asked for a post-mortem, and he got one, but there were no names in it. And we, we completely, we just say engineer one is the person who causes the incident or is the first responder, and then we just number them through. So after half a year, you don't know who caused it. Maybe the person who caused it still knows. Um, we also open source all our tooling. At some point, we were like, OK, we have an open source operating system. Then we have Nginx, we have MySQL, we have everything that's open source. And then we have our thin hosting layer on top, which is proprietary and closed. And at some point, like, it was over beers, we talked together. And at some point, we came up with, like, hmm, shouldn't we just open source our hosting layer and make, like, just give it to the world? First, I thought it's, <laughs> it's a dumb idea. Why would we? That's, like, all we have. And then we thought about it. And at some point, we were like, yeah, we can, sure, we can do that. 
it's cool. Like everybody can help, everybody can audit it. We have a lot of customers, they do a yearly audit. And what the in the past they we spun up the whole cluster stuff we have and gave them root access and let them do all their penetration testing. Now we can just tell them, hey, there is the Git repository, run it yourself and come back with everything that you find. Um, another thing we really started to look into is um, treating the infrastructure which we have in code, really develop it as its code. We stopped caring about like, this is a server, this needs to be beautified and stuff. No, it's code and you treat it like it, it's tested, you, it's versioned, like you really change the perception of your handler. And we also look at the no-op thing from various angles to improve how we act upon it. So for us, it's really a thing that the customer experience um, goes up if we do that right. Because it's kind of like when you wanted to make a phone call, like a long distance phone call, for example, um, the last time, did you pick up the phone, dial a number, and then you had something, yes, who can I connect you with? No, of course not. It's a no ops thing that you just dial the number of the pe person you want to reach, and you get this person to the phone. And in our journey, we also treat support a little bit different than other companies. We do chat ops in in the way that we prefer the direct communication with our customers instead of pushing them to do it um, via ticketing system. Because when they ping us in their Slack and or Slack, um, we see it and some of our engineers are online and first respond to it and say, hey, I can help you with that. This also gives us a lot of like closeness to our customer. Of course, it's hard to scale, but if you have one question that comes up over and over and over again, you just change your documentation because you see this question comes up because our documentation is bad. So let's go back to no ops. So when I first heard about no ops, I've thought about like this. We have DevOps and we have no ops. And I was like, that's no. We made so, mu so much progress in the past year that it was cool to have something. We improved our processes. And I read a little bit more, and it more felt like, yeah, we are just like configuring something and throwing it on the internet, and then we stop caring about it. And I was like, ah, no, that's not it. So I started to read more about it. So when we go back to the article, and I just highlighted some, some parts of it, it's like, improve the process of deploying applications. Yes, that's what I want to do. Everybody wants to do that. It's also never have to speak with an operations person again. Well, I don't agree 100% with it, but for standard operation procedures, nobody should need to call ops. It's like if you want to do a phone call, you just pick up the phone and dial a number and it works. You don't go to your cell provider and say, hey, I want to do a long distance phone call. And it's also all about the developers because they should have the tools at hand to ship their code faster. So I let that sink in a little bit and I came up with this. So actually DevOps is part of NoOps. So NoOps is basically pulling in all the things. Like it's to the most extent, it's the end goal kind of. Um, no worries about this, you're not losing your job, even if we do no ops. So you don't get rid of your job. And one question I always come up on, people say, ah, yeah, we do no ops, we out outsource everything. It's like, so I do like cloud computing since 10 years and more. And somebody told me like 10, 12 years ago, when the cloud hits, all of you IT people will ha have no job. And I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. Yeah, sure, of course. 10 years ago, we had physical hardware and we put it in a rack and we did the stuff with it. And currently we are just doing an API call and spin up a server. But honestly, I don't have less work since we have the cloud. It's 
much more, a little bit more complicated sometimes. Or who does serverless of you? Who has functions they run? Just a few of you. Just play with it, and it's so awesome. If you have just functions you can run, like API calls, and it does everything you want, it's fantastic. But as we started to use serverless infrastructure, people were like, yeah, you don't have, like, you will have much more time, and, like, your workload will go down. No, no, not, not a dime. So if you think about it this way, the chances are really, really, really high that you already started to adopt NOAPs without even knowing. So what is that NOAP thing? It's a huge misunderstanding, because if you read no and ops, it kind of treats you like you're getting rid of the operations, which is not really true. Um, it also doesn't mean unmaintained infrastructure, because it's a different way of looking at infrastructure. It's also not meaning that you get rid of your operations team, no. So it's an operational paradigm. It's a service design that the idea behind is it you have a service which is so well defined that you can just use it and it works. It's like a phone or like your internet connection. Um, it's also the meaning that your developers don't need to talk to the operations when they want to go live, when they want to have a new environment, when they want to add something to the deployment chain because it's standardized and it's in a self-service manner. And it's also, and I really like that, it's also giving more power to developers. Chris might not agree on that. <laughs> um, so the cool thing is, when you give more power, you're basically moving the developers a little bit more in the operation thing. So you build it, you also run it. Of course, when something goes wrong, they can still talk to us. And one thing I see very clearly when I look at all the, um, the changes soft the software industry goes through currently is that the operations part is more and more becoming a software development skill. Like, it's you need to know what your code does and how like distributed architecture works to survive in the new way of software is developed. And software developers just don't get around this. It's like they need to know how a queuing system works. They need to build up on that. And this all doesn't mean that you just get a tarball and it needs to be deployed, needs to be deployed uh, as fast as possible. It means that if there is a problem, they still can get back to the operations people, us. Um, it's also a lot about automation. So you try to improve your processes that they are like watertight. Um, we, we even allow our developers to change the Nginx configurations. And two weeks ago, it happened that uh, they pinged me in Slack and said, hey, um, there are two branches which don't deploy anymore. It's like, OK. And that can either be two things. Either something is broken, or they pushed a change which is not working. So I said, like, have you read the log files? Like, after the deployment, you see the changes. They come back in Slack, and it says exactly where the problem is. The problem was like file not found. And so I'm like, hmm, OK, probably check what it does. Or did you run it on your local machine? And he was like, no, I just pushed it. So, OK. <laughs> OK, can you please? build the Docker container on your local machine. And he's like, yeah, I have the same error now. I'm like, OK, now you can fix it. <laughs> so, And he wasn't aware that he basically had all the tools in hand to fix that. They did just a change, and they saw the error. But luckily, the process on, of deploying that huge application was stopping them from doing something catastrophic. If he wouldn't have a check and would have just rolled out the containers without even checking, the site would have gone down. But we have checks in place to basically make sure that stuff like this doesn't happen. So my theory of it is operations really love no opting things. We should just name it differently. I would name it relax ops. 
because we build a system which takes care of us. It takes care of us that we don't do stupid things. It's built in a way that it cannot fail. Of course it always will fail. Software is never error proof, but it's kind of designing a service. So how do we do no ops? So in our infrastructure, it's they can just create a branch and after 30 seconds, they have a message in Slack which says, hey, the new environment for that branch has been created. It runs all without even one operation second spent. It's automated to the core that if you create a branch, an environment is spotted. If you remove the branch, it's removed. We even go so uh, far that if you have a merge request to a branch, we create an environment for that merge request. So you can test this, um, your changes against the um, target branch. This means also our operations team doesn't need to care about creating new environments. We can just work and improve our processes and our infrastructure. Another thing is like, who runs his own mail server? Who loves it? Yes. Um, we had a. We, ha we host a lot of websites, so we also need to send emails, which is a pain because sometimes a site gets hacked or a form doesn't have a CAPTCHA. Yes, it still happens in 2017. Mm. So we really don't want to uh, run our own uh, mail servers, so we just outsource it. When did you, like I had just one case in the past years when I needed to talk to Amazon about raising the limits of sending emails. One time. And it was because we needed to send three million emails in half a day. In the end, it wasn't a problem because the code was so slow to process the emails that it, we never even reached the limit we wanted to have. But I just talked to them and say, okay, on your, um, on your dashboard it says you can send 10 mails per second I need more and they were like how much more and we just said it to them and it's done so it's really a no up thing as long as I'm below uh, inside their boundaries it works if I need more I talk to them so no ups has a few angles so if you have a solution a software solution which um, a customer can use your solution and it doesn't, he does not need to talk to you, you can scale much more than when they would need to talk to you. And it's also an operations angle. If you have things, you can basically buy in and have like software as a service and you just use that. You can basically also get rid of that and have more focus and more time at hand to work on this. So when it comes, DevOps versus NoOps to this conversation. It's more about DevOps is the culture and collaboration part, and NoOps is the focus and automation part. Thank you. So one small thing. Um, if you want to come to Zurich, it's really nice in summer. In winter, it's kind of like here. It has snow, and it's cold and miserable. Um, 2nd and 3rd May 2018, the CFP is open until, I guess, the 5th of December. I'm looking forward to a lot of talks submitted, and now we can go to the QA. Exactly. Okay, so uh, short ad at the end. Um, Zurich is nice. Oh, I have a question. Yeah, I'm just wondering um, how did the conversation with the devs go when you told them that they should have knowledge about the uh, uh, infrastructure that they are deploying on? Was it like, well, no, this is your job, you should do that. <laughs> I'm just wondering how that conversation did, did go down. Um, yeah, kind, it was kind of like that. So what we do is we give our um, customers or Developers, I use that term because I see the developers as customers because I have internal customers and external customers. Um, 
I see it the way that we have a standard set of a configuration which they can just build on it. So if they want the standard stuff, they can just use it. The configuration files are there, but they are not overwritten. If they want to change something, they most likely already have an idea what they want to achieve. So it's like in the old system where like they are like, hey, I need to have this change, they come to me. And now I'm like, hey, there is just a configuration file, and if you want to change it, just change it, run it on your local, and if it works, it works. So they were like, oh, you're giving us a lot of power. And it's like, yeah, and if you fuck up, it will go down. <laughs> so um, it's really like we have a lot of systems in place that make sure that you cannot bring the site down. Of course, if you do something stupid, it will fail at some point in the pipeline. And I have the feeling that the developers are very welcoming to have more power because all the operations task we do is like making sure everything is updated, making sure it performs the right way. But just giving them the opportunity to have whatever changes in the configuration was welcomed by a lot of them. Does that sort of answer the question? Thanks. Other questions? So maybe uh, what basic steps would you propose to get to this point? Okay. Um, so it's really hard to, to say where you start because you kind of blindly start to adopt it. Um, think about systems um, you want to get rid of. For example, sending emails or storing the locks somewhere. Or who of you uses Slack? Yes you're already externalizing stuff. Of course you can run rocket chat or some other chat on your premise, but if you don't need to, just start to adopt this. And the other part is like if you have the customer facing aspect, it's more service design. So you need to think about, um, just look at the daily work your team does and look at what is repeated all the time. So, hey, I need a new account. Hey. Can you please reset the password? Hey, I need a new environment. Stuff like that. And when you see a pattern, you can basically start to automate this away. So that's the, the easy steps I would do. Does that help? Wonderful. Thank you. I saw a question back here. Oh. Okay. I have a question in context of uh, SendGrid, for instance, um, the software as a service solutions. And then what about privacy in context of GDPR, you know, employing third-party solution? <laughs> yes, you run away. Yeah, I, then I, I, I see that. Um, being GDPR compliant is a huge thing. Um, I think, um, like, currently I see that we are basically re-rolling every contract we have with our customers because we are data processor. Um, this also means that we need to review the whole chain of communication throughout all the systems. Um, when it comes to email, I think you're covered with um, having a provider within the EU because anyways they need to be compliant. Um, but it's, it's a really hard thing. So yeah, probably a follow-up. Okay, so SendGrid is um, a US-based company, so and the emails are going through US um, uh, gateways. Um, yep. Some of them c can go, of course, by you, but uh, you cannot choose them. So, so Yeah, that's true. Um, the thing is, and that's the interesting part of the GDPR, is that basically wherever data is processed for an EU citizen, you need to be compliant. So even SendGrid needs to be GDPR compliant because the EU will just walk up to them and say, hey, uh, I want all to have all my data and they need to provide it for them. So I think you should be covered. But um, there's always a but. Um, there are also uh, mass email services in the, in the European Union. For example, uh, MailChat, they are based in France. They do the same service, and they are in within the EU boundaries, and they can do that. Okay, so we're limiting. Okay, one more question. Back here. Uh, 
I've got a question. Have you ever been in a situation when the uh, the change rate was so high that you w was actually having problems problems to automate it? Mm, so the the change the rate of change? Yes, the rate of change was so high that the automation would make you make a drag. Um, so far not. Um, we have a few things that we struggled automating, but in the end, if the, the the rate of change is too fast, probably the technology you try to automate it, it is not the correct one. But we, I guess, I'm not getting the full extent of the question. We can talk about it afterwards if you want to. Okay, last question. Don't you think that in the environments built on, uh, on top of Mesos, uh, DCS, uh, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and uh, HashiCorp uh, Nomad, it is easier to implement NoOps ideas because it separates the development side from from the ops side. So it's a kind of natural environment uh, for this kind of. Um, yes and no. Um, yes, because you give a lot of power and. Um, ability to, to influence the system to the developers, but also no, because setting up an uh, OpenShift cluster isn't just something you do like this. It needs a little bit of knowledge. So um, of course, it gives, it no opses the whole thing of running the application, but still there is one trench of like maintaining the Docker image and maintaining security uh, is still a, a really an operations task. So. It makes it easier, but it still needs both parts of the pie to, to work together. Okay, thank you, Bastian. Big applause.